Hey, what is up, Jason? Thank you for making time here on the Metal Mix. We are talking to Jason Bittner from Shadows Fall, Overkill, and even playing Flotsam and Jetsam. So I was reading here when you started playing drums that you started playing when you were around like five years old, banging pots and pans and started getting lessons around 10 years old. Is that true? What's your inspirations on uh, how did you start playing drums? you for a second. Um, I, it wasn't like I was born into this, like, this musical family and it was around me, so it inspired me. However, my parents were very musical in a sense that they were always listening to music. Like, the stereo was always on, the, the albums were always on, and my parents, even though they had similar music tastes, they also had very different music tastes. So I was getting inundated with all this great music at a very young age. Like, my dad was more so into, like, Southern rock. Like, all, like a lot of bands that had two drummers, too. Allman Brothers, 38 Special, Marshall Tucker Band, Skinner, um you know, the band, a lot of that kind of stuff. So that's where I was getting that kind of musical influence from Doobie Brothers. Um, but my mom listened to a lot of the 60s stuff. So I, I was hearing Cream, Jimi Hendrix, you know, The Doors. So I was immediately drawn to, you know, Mitch Mitchell and Ginger Baker because, you know, I, I was attracted to the drums. I started taking lessons formally when I was eight, which was third, third grade. Um, in my school district, you were able to start music lessons at, on, in second grade, except for drums. You weren't allowed to start till third grade for whatever reason or another. So yeah. I started my actual physical notation of learning how to read music and holding the sticks properly and all that um, in third grade. So I did, you know, elementary school for, you know, just on the pad and playing on the pad and <laughs> got my first drum set when i was coming out of fifth into sixth grade it was like you know yeah. one bass drum one tom one snare drum one cymbal um so it was very basic and it made me appreciate things you know knowing that i just wasn't having things handed to me like you know it took me forever to build my drum set and i did it by you know having a paper out and saving up my money and not just asking my parents for things because we didn't come from a well-to-do background yeah so it i was able to to appreciate that stuff at a very young age, which I think was very important in my formation. So by the time I got to middle school, then I was taking lessons with the, with the school instructor there, because even though he was a, he was a woodwinds player, he was a sax player. He was also a, a very proficient drummer as well. So I would take, you know, I, I was in concert band and jazz band and all that, but on, in my free periods, I'd go down to the to the music room and he would let me play the drums. He just let me go in the percussion room and just play the drums for the 45 minutes of the period or lunch or whatever. And he'd show me things here and there. So, <laughs> so I would start, I was learning fills and I was kind of like ahead of the curve of the other drummers in school because I was spending my free time with Mr. Stan Campiano and not out on the field playing football or baseball or anything like that, <laughs> which is why I wasn't a jock in high school. I didn't get into the physical fitness aspect really of things i mean yeah i raced bmx when i was a kid but you know i started going to the gym when i was in high school just to lose weight but when i was a kid you know i wasn't a jock i i was spending my time you know learning how to play my my instrument better and and learning how to take a snare drum apart rather than worrying about you know running down the field to try to score a touchdown yeah so by the time I, i got into my later years of middle school you know, that's when the formation of where I think my head was going musically w- was at. Because by eighth grade, you know, once we once I uh, once MTV hit, you know, my first real drum influence as far as like someone to emulate myself after was Stuart Copeland because I was just massively into the police when Ghost in the Machine was out because you <laughs> could, you couldn't turn on MTV and not see one of the videos off that record at any point usually. So. He was the first guy that really, you know, made me think about the actual drummer, per se. So then once Iron Maiden kind of entered the picture, that's what kind of threw me towards metal. And Parrot and Rush, and then it was all over. You know, Neil became my favorite drummer of all time ever. And, you know, the guy that I looked up to for pretty much everything with that. You know, just, you know, the lyric writing, the playing, the, the way he handled himself. I mean, the guy was just, I can't say enough, enough wonderful things about him. So that's pretty much where that all to Berkeley. And, you know, here we are 
30 some odd years later. That's awesome, man. Um, did you ever think uh, as a little kid that, that you'd be uh, in all these like big bands? No, nope. uh, you know, a lot of favorite bands. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and so we're, Stigmata and uh, Burning Human, your first projects. Well, in reality, I really don't go back in my musical history. Yeah previous to stigmata because i don't really talk about local bands because what's the sense of talking about local bands in the albany tri-city area unless you're from this area i don't want i know all the people in the 5180 area code right now are all going to get pissed off well, what are you talking about we supported your bands in the 80s I, I, and I appreciate that but most people don't know who suspended animation is <laughs> <laughs> And I'll let you know who that is. That's the first band that I really put together and started playing out with in 1988. It was my band for the most part. We had a singer, ironically, who sounded a lot like Bobby Blitz. And he was Overkill was his favorite band. And we played like four Overkill songs. Ironic. Did it set me up for the future? Probably. But my point is, if you weren't there in 1988 or 1989, you wouldn't know this band or, or whatever. So I kind of, you know, I, I skip over like from the time I left Berkeley, which was 88, 89, 89. I skip over from 89 to 94, really, because it was just local bands. It wasn't like they weren't good local bands, but it was nothing that never really that ever really did anything. Yeah. No, I, I dig it. I, I understand that. Man. Records, <laughs> did tours, went overseas to Europe, went on tour in the States. We were the first band that wasn't just a quote unquote local band. So, so once again, no disrespect to any of the people that I played with prior to <laughs> the stings, but you know, that's it. That's the, that's, that's where, you know, you can't talk about every single thing in, in, in your history. But yeah, the no, funny thing is, you know, with all the time that we spent in the early 90s with Stigmata, we, we put our blood, sweat and tears into that. And it, and, it, and it just hit a point where we just couldn't get we couldn't get signed. We couldn't get to the next level. And there was a lot of things that were that were standing in our way because of that, that I found out, you know, things I find out later on in life um, as a member of other bands. Uh like basically what I'm getting at is in, in 90 late 94, early 95 stigmata had a bunch of labels pretty much going after us. You know, we're going down to New York and doing a lot of label showcases and stuff. We did a couple for Warner brothers. We did one for Mega four. There was, you know, just a bunch of, you know, just the typical stuff that you used to do back in the eighties and the nineties. And we were really close between century media and Roadrunner two. And we were talking to century media and they, and they had gotten to a point where, because they knew that we were working on our record, even though we were self-financing it, but we were doing it for real. It wasn't like we were in some local studio. We were in you know, Normandy Sound in Rhode Island, and we were spending a lot of money on the record. So it was one of those things where we were trying to get signed to Century Media, but they hit a point, and now I didn't find out about any of this until years later when I was in Shadows Fall, and you know, we were Century Media's biggest band. And one day when I was at the record offices, I was talking with one of the president, you know, with the president, Robert, and he was like, you know what? I really like Stigmata. I'm like, yeah, I did too. He's like, you know why we didn't sign you guys? I'm like, no. I said, why didn't you sign up? You know, so now tell me 15 years later, how come this didn't happen? And he said, at that time, he goes, it was down. It was a, basically a toss up between you guys and Marauder. And we're like, Okay. And we chose Marauder over you guys because they said that they thought that we seemed unstable and we were going to break up at any moment. Even <laughs> though what happened is the exact opposite. <laughs> we broke up because we didn't get signed. They signed Marauder and then Marauder splintered into nobody except for Jorge. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, it, that's it's very ironic how how small of an industry it really is and things that happened 25 years ago have an impact on where i am now um another thing with that too is that you know i met i met all the guys in shadows fall through being in stigmata and burning human because we all played shows together years ago when brian used to be in overcast we'd play shows with burning human stigmata overcast you know, uh, Paul was yeah. in a band called Push Button Warfare with Zeus, who was our producer. We played shows of Burning Human with those guys. Stigmata played with Shadows Fall when Shadows Fall start, first started playing. 
So it was this very, very incestuous kind of scene between New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, because we're all within like an hour and a half, two hours of each other. Yeah. So that was really how, how I got in Shadows Fall, which was literally not for another, oh my God, you know, like <laughs> eight years later. Because uh, no, I, I, I joined Shads in the end of 2001. So that's like, you know, seven, seven, eight years after the Stigmata days. But it was, it made for a, a not an uncomfortable first time going to jam with the guys because it wasn't like I was going to meet four strangers. I already knew them. So <laughs> it made it a lot easier. Let's put it that way. No, I think that's awesome, dude. I mean, the first time I ever got into Shadows Fall, the first song I ever heard was like Inspiration On Demand. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember hearing that, the power of I and I, and I remember like uh, buying your album and like, I remember it would always have like the DVD track where it like, it show you playing the songs and stuff, dude. And that's crazy. So is Shadow Small doing anything recently right now? Uh, well, that's the sad part. Uh, due to Anthrax and Overkill being <laughs> be- busy bands, uh, it, it, it's really hard for John and I to schedule anything. Um, it, it's usually coming down to something where he's available and I'm not, or I'm not on tour and he is or whatever. Um, yeah. we had something planned for this year and I, we had two things planned for, first of all, we got a, I can talk about this now because it doesn't matter because it didn't happen and yeah. it was last month anyways. Um, we actually got an offer last year to go to Manila Philippines, which would have been last month in May, and play the SummerSlam Festival, which is the festival that we did with the promoter Vernon Go down there years and years and years ago. It's where we filmed our Madness in Manila DVD, and we were the first band to headline that festival back in 2009. This was going to be the last year he was going to do it. Iron Maiden was going to be the headliner, and he wanted to fly us in to be the direct support band. Kind of like bring us all you know, kind of like bring it all full circle. So we would have, we said that would have been one hell of a fucking reunion show. And we started putting the ball in motion. Like I said, this, ha- you know, we got this offer last year. And at the, at the, when we got the offer, I was actually in Europe on tour with Overkill. And as soon as I got back to the venue, cause I was out, I was out to dinner while I got, when I got the, uh, the email, I pull Blitz and Didi aside. I go, what's our plans for May of next year? And they're like, well, we should be working on the new record by then, which is what we were supposed to be doing right now. Yeah. Um, so I go, but we're no, no tours, right? And they're, they're like, yeah. I go, so can I escape for five days so I can fly to the Philippines and do this one off? And they're like, yeah, cool. No problem. You know, it's not going to interfere with us. Excellent. So I got the okay. The guys who had jobs, got clearance from their jobs. Sadly, what it came down to was John did not have clearance because there was a potential anthrax show that weekend. So we pulled the plug on that and death angel ended up getting the gig. Well, it doesn't matter anyways, because the gig didn't happen because like I said, it was supposed to be two weeks ago and iron maiden canceled their whole tour for this year anyways. So like I said, it was a moot point, but it would have been a really cool gig. Um, and we had something else that we were going to announce too, and that was going to be announced last month. And it's not going to be announced now because we have no idea if it's even if it's even a a possibility anymore due to COVID. Sadly, yeah, no, dig it, dude. I, there was, there know, was something that was going to happen, but once again, <laughs> once again, that black cloud of something came in. This time, it was a damn virus. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean about being in three projects like um so do you have to forecast your whole schedule like a year ahead of time because you're playing with flotsam and jetsam overkill and then you had these fans of shadows fall is it is it just like is everything always like a year out when you plan it from what um well uh, i was asking um since you're like in three projects and um you're needed for all three projects do you have to plan out all your shows oh no i'm not i'm not i'm not in flotsam anymore oh you're not in flotsam no, I haven't been. I haven't been in Flotsam since I left to join Overkill. I I did go back and play some shows with them last summer because their drummer Ken uh, had to go to Europe. So I did fill in last year for like ten uh, okay. days. But I haven't been. I haven't been with them since 2017. 
Only wow. because of what you're getting at. There would have been no way for me to stay in two working bands and be able to schedule that. No, no way. It just would have been too much. I, I actually wanted to do that at first, but there would have been no way to work the touring schedules out. Yeah, no, I dig it, man. So, dude, um, you're already a badass in all these bands. Did, did you ever think that you were going to start doing, like, clinics and, and, and doing, like, teachings to other people? Is, is teaching something that you always thought you were going to do? Yes. Uh, I always knew that from a kid, well, what, since I was a kid, because I, I, was going to, I was going to school for music education in the first place. So that was part of my double major was, was going to be teaching anyways. Um, yeah. I always liked giving lessons. Um, and I always, I always wanted to be involved in drum clinics because I always loved going to them when I was a kid. So basically in 2004, when, when my name was starting to, you know, to become a something and I started to get the opportunity with Tama when I was still playing Tama drums to do, start doing clinics with them, you know, I, I jumped at that chance. So here we are 15 years later, you know, there's not a lot of that stuff coming. Um, you know, there's some ways I'm already uh, thinking of doing some things online. I'm actually going to be setting up some Zoom conferences soon to start doing some master classes and stuff for just like small amounts of people so I can keep it like 15, 20 people and keep everybody engaged rather than just doing like a Facebook live or whatever, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely, man. I, I bet there's a, a lot of uh, awesome gifts you get from teaching, man. Is, uh, is, is that one of your favorite things is just being able to see like the smile on people's faces after you teach them a lesson? Sometimes. Yes. Sometimes it's also the, the, the smile that's not on my face from having to listen to 35 minutes of someone who didn't practice their lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like every, revising their homework. <laughs> I am not gonna. I am not gonna sit here and tell you that teaching doesn't have its days because it certainly does. Ninety ninety four percent of the time, it's very gratifying and it's it's fun to do and I enjoy it. But there's just there's some days where I just don't want to be in here, which is why I took a little bit of a hiatus from teaching locally for like a year. I just needed I needed to take a step down. I just wasn't giving myself enough free time. And when I found that when I was going in for lessons, I wasn't able to focus. I thought enough for the students. I mean, they might have not seen that, but I just felt like, you know, to me, sometimes I kind of was just like, you know, winging it and just getting through it, which that's not me. Because usually I take, you know, I'll take a good amount of time and I have my lesson plans and I prepare things and I know what, you know, who's coming in and what we're going to work on and stuff like that. But it's got to be a point where I was just had so much going on. It was just like, oh, uh, who's coming for lesson? Oh, whatever. I'll just teach him whatever. And some, you know, people can see through that. So, you know, I, I actually put myself into sabbatical last year for a little while. And it was and it was nice to do that because I took a good eight months away from having people here and doing the private lesson thing. I was still doing Skype lessons, still doing lessons on tour. But that was um, there was less less stress with that. Like if I'm giving lessons on tour, that's pretty easy to be honest with you because i have a pretty good amount of free time on the road you know i'm just waiting between sound check and playing or whatever so there's plenty of free time if i'm home there's not free time at home there's you know the garage that needs to be cleaned up there's the lawn that needs to be mowed there's you know something that needs to be painted there's all these other things that are taking away from my time and there's some days where i'm like Oh man, you know the sixty bucks that I just made for this hour for this lesson. I could have just took this lesson and I this, this time and not made the money, and I could have got you know that bedroom painted in this same amount of time. Or something, you know? <laughs> so it's like there's just some days where you gotta just you know kind of check yourself and be like, all right, time to take a break for a second. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, man. I feel like I just became a dad, so sometimes like I still try to do the music and radio thing, and I'm just you like, no free time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm just like, man, I gotta sleep eventually. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, I know, I know you're three hours ahead, so I even like I set my alarm for like five a.m. in case I got like an email. <laughs> so, like, I was like, all right, if 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 it's eight o'clock for uh, eight in the morning for Jason, it's gonna be five for me. So I gotta wake up at five and read my <laughs> my email. <laughs> oh god, I wouldn't have hit you that early. No way. <laughs> huh. So, um. Uh, playing all these shows, doing all these clinics. Um, is there a show for you that really stands out where like you kind of had a moment where you're like, man, like this is it. Like this is my big show. Did you ever have a moment like that? 
Uh, like, you know, like I, I, I'm taking forever to answer this one. It's kind of, I don't know, to be quite honest with you. You know, there's been a lot of those more like big tours. Um, I would definitely say that the first time filling in with Anthrax, that was definitely one of those, okay, this is a big show moment. Uh, <laughs> I would say that opening for Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath every day for nine weeks, that's pretty much a big show moment. <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, did you playing so many shows and everything. Do you, do you still get uh, nervous playing shows? or, or I don't. Do I knock on wood do not get nervous playing shows um i i really don't for some for some reason i i i i've never luckily had any bouts with stage fright or anything like that i don't even really think about it i just want to go out there and do my job the only time i ever might think about the crowd is if you fuck up and oh shit how many people just saw that (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah Um, i think I think a, a guitar player could mess up and nobody really notice it that bad. But if a drummer messes up, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you're pretty much screwed if you're the drummer. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, for the most part, it's not like I don't have nerves or pre-show jitters or anything like that. But pretty much once, you know, when, when we're moving and everything is, you know, going the way it is, the only time I get nervous, nervous is if we're doing one-offs or fly-in dates or we're doing festivals and we just got there 45 minutes prior to when we were supposed to be on stage. You don't know what kind of gear you're getting. That's the only time when I get, like, nervous because more so it's a nervousness of, all right, I need to go see what's going on here because I want to be able to perform my job at – at the top of my game and if i can't do that because the kit's shitty or the bass drum head's broken or whatever and i gotta try to find a a way to fix this with 20 minutes to do it then that can get a little you know hairy but that doesn't happen a lot thankfully and my tech animal is great so usually between the two of us we we don't really have those battles a lot thank god that's good man yeah a tech's kind of like your caddy if you're playing golf uh, he's, your, your back. he's your right hand man. He's the ba- he's the he's the bake to my shake. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, I think that's absolutely awesome. Um, being on the road and like playing with all these big artists, is there was there ever like a compliment that you got by one of your favorite artists that just like totally like helped like shape uh, shift like your career? Not shift your career, but just like a comment that really made your day. Well, yeah, there's been a lot of that. Um, uh, yeah, give me, give me your, give me your two or three. <laughs> well, the first one being when, <sighs> when I first met Lauren Wheaton, who was Neil Parrott's drum tech for, you know, the last twenty or so years of of his career. When I first met Lauren, and expressed to him how much I wanted to meet his boss, he was like, he knows who you are, and I went. No, he does not. He goes, yes he, yes, he does. I go, there's no way that Neil Parrott knows who I am. He goes, Biddy, trust me. He knows who you are. Okay. So that was the first thing. And then that was that was solidified later on. When the end of that was when Nick Raskalenis, who was working with Shadows Fall on Threads of Life, was also working with Rob. He brought up threads of life and was playing something off our record for neil and it was something some song that on there that i did this drum thing that was a little neil related and he played it for neil and he told me that neil liked the the little lick and he's like oh neil mentioned that thing that you did i go you mean the thing that i stole from him he goes yeah he goes he liked that i went well all right my my plagiarism worked out to my benefit so that's probably the biggest that's the biggest compliment right there to me to know that and then like i said you know a year later i got to meet him become friends with him over the next 10 years but if he ever told me in a million years that my biggest hero would like something that i did on tape that's pretty cool so (laughs) that the other the other probably holy shit moment definitely in my life there's been i like i said there's there's been a lot of them i've been very fortunate um uh the, the the next holy shit moment was i did um drum magazine did a did this thing called drum night in san jose california uh, i want to say i think it was 2012 maybe 2011 to it was 2011 12 or 13 i know it's a three-year span but i i can't i really don't remember at this time what year it was it was one of those three years so anyways 
the players on the bill were me, Chad Smith from the Chili Peppers, who's a very good friend of mine, and Cindy Blackman. It was it was three of us. Now, Cindy Blackman, in case you don't know, is married to Carlos Santana. Oh, yeah. yes, the Carlos Santana. <laughs> so. My wife says to me, maybe I should go out to this thing in San Jose because maybe Carlos is going to be there. I go, there is no way Carlos Santana is going to come to this drum clinic. What he, he, you know, he's, he would get mobbed if he ever comes to this, this thing. I'm like, there's no way he's going to show up. So that's what I think, right? <laughs> so I'm on stage and I'm playing and I look over in the wings and there's Carlos Stan- Santana standing there. And I went, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> first off i'm in the middle of a drum solo that i'm realizing carlos santana is watching and i'm like oh shit the second level of oh shit was my wife is going to kill me when i tell her that he actually came to this thing oh god <laughs> so i get done with my program i get done with my whole thing he sits there he watches the whole 45 minutes of it i couldn't believe it cindy wasn't even there the whole time he stood there the whole entire time watch what i did I come walking off stage. I went to introduce myself to Cindy, and and I said, Mr. Santana, I said, it's an absolute honor to meet you. And he said, he put his hands on my shoulders, and he said, my son, you are anointed. Do you know what that means? And I went, and before I got a chance to even say yes, I got as far as saying yes, and he goes, and he looked at me, he goes, You're, you've been touched by the hand of God with your talent. And I, I, I literally was probably white as a ghost. I just was like, thank you very much. That absolute honor coming from you. Oh, my God. You know, I went to the dressing room. I was just like, oh, my God. 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 <laughs> you know, <laughs> this guy, number one, he's got quite an amazing drummer and his wife who plays with him. He's had some of the most amazing drummers like Dennis Chambers ever, you know, being behind him on, on a drum throne. And he's sitting there telling me that he was, you know, that he liked what I did. So... <laughs> that's that was pretty amazing that is that is so insane man honestly i almost got like the goosebumps you telling me those stories man because uh carlos santana is a god i know if i if i ever just saw him i would probably like turn white dude but the fact that he put his hands on your shoulders and was it was it was almost like like he knighted you like he was like it, a king it was it really was it's just like oh my god <laughs> he's, like, like, he's like he's like you are a great knight yeah it was, it was it was it was crazy. That is awesome, man. So um, we have uh, two more questions left. So, um, what are three things that you love doing outside of music? Well, going to the gym when there's a gym to go to. But I would just say exercising, yoga, and hanging out with my wife and cats. That's about it. Dude, hey, that's not- pretty simple. Outside of drums, it's drum drumming related things: collecting drums, cleaning drums. Restoring drums and <laughs> hang out with my wife and cats. <laughs> That's it. That's awesome, man. You know what? You do so much with drums. Did you ever think about ever like uh, creating your own drum company or your own brand? No, because that stuff is really far. It's really thin and it's few and far between, and it's real hard. It's really hard to start and succeed with any kind of boutique company or anything like that. No, I I dig it, man. Well, that's awesome. Well, hey, man, I appreciate you making time to talk with me today here on the Metal Mixtape. You're totally awesome. And, um, hey, could you do me one last favor before uh, I let you go? Yep. Can you, uh, you want to say, this is Jason Bittner and you're listening to the Metal Mixtape? Sure. I'm ready when you are. Hey, what's up? This is Jason Bittner from Overkill and you're listening to the Metal Mixtape. Hey, Jason, thank you so much for being on the show and you have a beautiful day, brother. Awesome. You too. Take care. And that was the interview with Jason Bittner, man. All right. Thoughts, Josh. Thoughts. What'd you, what'd you think about the interview? I oh, was... oh for, hold on. Sorry. This is the top of the hour. You're listening to KSKQ here on 89.5 Ashton, Oregon, 94.1 Medford, Oregon, streaming line on KSKQ. Oh! 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 And this is for the billions and, and billions, billions of listeners listening around the world. Okay, Josh, what'd you think about the interview with Jason Bittner? I was enthralled the whole time, dude. I just kind of sat there and listened to his stories. It was like you'd say something and you actually then steal what you said while the interview was, while we were listening to that. You'd ask him a question and I would open up Pandora's box of answers. 
Dude, yeah, and you dude, ten minutes of answers coming your way, and that's like those are the best interviews. You know what? You know what? Jason Bittner is. You know what's crazy is like um, in this same week, I've talked to Michelangelo Badio, uh, Badio, and him, and um, a lot of people say that you never want to meet your heroes because you never know how they're going to act and they might disappoint you. But I've been nothing but just like they've been they've been nothing but great and humble amazing musicians man like even in the middle of our interview with jason benner i was telling you earlier um um the phone cut out and i and he let me call him back while it was cutting out and everything and he was so nice that's cool you know what i mean so and dude jason is just so awesome and like to hear these stories man about how like neil pert was like like just like told him he was like, he was great and then have like Carlos Santana say that the hand of God touched you with talent for music. That's amazing, man. That's just like when he. Uh, it, it's you know what's crazy is that I was literally I was telling Josh I was at the bathroom at work, um, trying to um, on the phone with uh, Jason Bittner while my friends were bumping Limp Biscuit outside of the door. So I literally had to walk outside and tell them to turn it down. Cause they're, I, cause like I'm talking to Jason all I hear, it's on for the Nookie, the Nookie. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like, I, I walked out and I was like, I was like, Cody, turn it down. I'm on the phone with Jason Bittner. <laughs> and they're like, oh, all right, man. <laughs> but you know, going back to Jason, man, he's so great. Please check out, I mean, I don't know if I, I don't even have to ask you to check out Overkill. You know who Overkill, but check them out. Um, um, and so it sounds like after the COVID stuff too, that Shadows Fall might make a reunion tour, which sounded awesome. So man, that was just great. That was awesome. And yeah, so here at, in 23 minutes, we're going to be interviewing Dustin Anderson from Life Farewell next, but we should get some music going. What do we got here, Josh? We have... Oh, okay. It's all good. Do, 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 this is the uh, demos, some of the early demos, pre Sebastian Bach Skid Row demos. Oh, yeah. Oh, I think I remember album. you yeah, bringing this. Yeah, I played this. some stuff on this before. What do we got, bro? We're going to listen to Youth Gone Wild. Ooh, that's number four. And, You've uh, been on a four spree today. I guess so. Every track has been number four. Overkill is number four. Right? Wasn't it? Wicked was number four, yeah. Uh, War of Words was number five. Ah. Five, four, four. Ah. We need to have like a four day where we bring out a bunch of CDs and we only play track four. This is uh, the metal mixtape with track four where we only play track four of every album. You want a track five? You better listen to another show because we only play track Track four. four. (laughs) (laughs) I hope I'm going to go after this. After this show, I'm going to go patent that idea before somebody steals track four. I love it. (laughs) Track four mixtape. Well, without further ado, here on the track four mixtape, this is track four of the CD. You've gone wild by Skid Row here. (laughs) 